creativity, critical inquiry, and community building are keys to dismantling negative paradigms and constructing a new vision for the future of healthcare. Please welcome Dr. Mays. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute her. Hi. I wonder there you if go. y'all can hear me now. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for everyone who has joined us on, uh, on our, our panel discussion today, our webinar. We are so excited to be here with you all and we want to start off by saying happy Black Maternal Health Week and we have a lot to talk about um, in the face of COVID-19, um, talking about our resiliency and resources and we have a really wonderful panel of, of experts uh, who have been doing this work uh, in the community, in, uh, in academia, um, both nationally and internationally and I'm, we're so excited. Um, for you all to join us today. So I want to also uh, thank MOAD for uh, sponsoring our, this webinar and really making space for community to talk about strength and resilience during this time. We're talking a lot about sort of how we're affected and sort of negatively impacted, but um, we really appreciate MOAD uplifting um, the resiliency and the strength piece around COVID because we know that that, that is happening. Uh, we also want to thank the Mothers to Mothers Postpartum Justice Project um, for uh, also helping to, helping to champion this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, we want just you all to know that Mothers to Mothers uh, Postpartum Justice Project centers its work on Black and Indigenous communities to support maternal health, health equi equity. The, M2, uh, the Mothers to Mothers Project is run entirely by a community of volunteers and activists and health professionals who make up the entire board and consultants. So we're so happy um, for the Mothers to Mothers is also uh, partnering for this webinar. I do wanna start off by introducing our panelists. Again, we um, have uh, amazing leaders um, um, that we're talking, talking to, uh, today. They're representing communities. So we're really happy that um, they're here with us today. Um, the first panelist I want to introduce is um, doula Linda Jones. Um, Linda Jones is a birth doula and postpartum doula. She's also a birth journey photographer and the co-founder of the Black Women Birthing Justice Project. Um, she's also a board member of Mother to Mother. Uh, Linda Jones is a doula, photographer, author, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. She's been a part of the natural birth advocacy and reproductive justice community in the Bay Area for almost three decades. She's one of the co-founders of the Black Women Birthing Justice Project uh, and co-author of Battling Over Birth, Black Women and the Maternal Health Crisis in California. Her work focuses on training, mentoring, and supporting women of color to be doulas for low-income women of color, helping families bring babies into the world and get their families started in the best possible way has helped to heal, heal her own traumatic birth experiences. Being able to potentially change how women of color presently are treated during birth makes her heart full. Thank you so much, Linda, for being with us. Second, I want to introduce Dr. Joy Cooper. Dr. Joy, Joy Cooper is a Philadelphia native and an obstetrician and gynecologist at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. She completed her residency at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania. She earned an MD from Howard University and completed a master's in sexually transmitted infections and HIV at University College of London, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she also earned an AB in African and African American Studies at Harvard College. When she's not on call catching babies or traveling the globe, she's fulfilling her mission to impact women of the African diaspora through her organization's Daughters of the Diaspora, Inc and telemedicine startup, Culture Care, which we'll hear more about today. And then last, but certainly not least, I want to introduce Dr. Monica McLemore. Doctor at the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. McLemore is a tenured associate professor in the Family Health Care Nursing Department, an affiliated scientist with Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, and a member of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health. She retired from clinical practice as a public health nurse and staff nurse for 28 years in her clinical nursing career. Her program of research is grounded in reproductive justice, 
a lens she uses to understand reproductive health and rights for people with the capacity for pregnancy. Her work is grounded in the hypothesis that if we center the most marginalized people, care improves for everyone. Dr. Monica McLemore is also a board member of Mother to Mothers Postpartum Justice Project. Thank you all. So again, I'm so excited that we are all here together and having this conversation about Black maternal health. Um, there are so many things that are very timely and really talking about our resilience and resources in the time of COVID. So I wanna start off with um, just bringing our panelists into, the, into this conversation, our conversation with the first question, um, and because you will all work in different sort of vantage points with Black maternal health. So from your direct work with Black women or on Black women's health issues, how is the COVID-19 health crisis affecting Black birthing women or Black maternal health from your perspective? And Dr. and Monica McLemore, we'll start with you. Awesome, thank you everyone for having me and thank you for being on. Um, I uh, use uh, she, her, her pronouns, and I just wanna wish a happy uh, Black Maternal Health Week to everyone. Um, one of the things that I'll, you'll hear me say quite a bit today is, you know, we innovate um, and we have innovated since, you know, we were brought to this continent. And, and so whether it's club quarantine um, or really trying to figure out how to really support our community dual issues and telehealth, to the, the ways that people have really stepped up for each other in terms of personal protective equipment or really thinking through, you know, how to get folks the meals that they need. You know, resilience is, is encoded on our genome. And quite frankly, I like for people to remember that and to remember that, you know, human rights and informed consent are no reasons, you know, no things that we should take lightly, nor should we, you know, be considering violation of those things just because we happen to be in a pandemic. And to remember that we have rights and that we have the opportunity to really optimize, you know, our relationships with each other. And we can come out of this super changed and be able to, to make some of the important things that we've seen happen permanent. And Dr. Joy. Um, thanks again for having me. Uh, I am fortunate enough to work in Oakland and this great community that has welcomed me here for the last three yes. years. Um, and I will honestly say the concern I have more than anything is postpartum. Um, I say every speech I give or every time I'm talking is just that already we're in a very displaced community where a lot of people's, um, their family members, their um, their community is spread out throughout the Bay Area, as far as Pittsburgh and Brentwood um, to, you know, Fremont and all these other different cities around um, this area. And already, you know, COVID-19 walked into a situation of displacement to making it even more displaced where you have the social distance. And that keeps, you know, new moms away from their their family members who can really support them at this time. So I really, you know, I know pregnancy is definitely like a risk factor. We can talk about the medical things that might happen with COVID, but even more so, I think I'm concerned more socially about what happens once you come home with a baby and you're by yourself and the people who really were supposed to be your key people that support you are too far and too risky for them to come out and actually help you. Mm -hmm. That's what I really con concerns me is when, you know, the social part is really what, you know, makes, the medicine hard. And that's when you get higher risk of postpartum depression. And I've really seen it more. So my patients who've been displaced, whose parents, you know, live here in Oakland, but they live in Brentwood and such like that. So really my, you know, charge to everyone on this call is check on your postpartum friend. Thank you. This is a good segue for um, Dula Linda. Can you give us your perspective and how, how, how your work and how um, from your vantage point are black birthing women being affected during COVID-19? Yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think the biggest thing that's affecting doulas right now is they're, they're being shut out of the support team of people who really need us to be there. Um, hospitals have decided that only one or maybe no support people can come in. And this affects us on all levels. It affects the doulas because it's, in fact, it's affecting their income level. And they're now pretty much out of work. People are canceling their contracts. And um, the doulas that are community doulas who, who are working with women in our community 
um, are the ones that are the most important, I think, and need to be there with these people. And they're they're not allowed to do that. So um, I'm hoping this is not a trend where they're saying, well, we don't really need doulas. We can just keep doing this the way we used to do it. And um, I don't want that to happen. And I really believe that it's important for women in our community to know about what doulas are and how we can help them both in birth and in postpartum because we can bridge that gap that Joy was talking about between parents that can't get to them and, and themselves and try to help them with their babies. So it's really important that the doula become an essential part of the birth team in my estimation, COVID or not. So, so Linda, thank you for that. And I want to uh, sort of follow up question with you um, and, because I know we, we've talked a little about how you've adjusted your work as a doula. Um, to respond to the COVID crisis. And there, there still is, the doulas should still be involved in the birthing process and are so essential. Can you tell us a little bit about how you have adjusted some of your work or in the other, in the doula community, how the doulas have adjusted their work and what you can tell women around that? Right. Um, what's happening is because we can't be there physically, we're trying to do our doula work by Zoom or FaceTime or telephone um, because these women still need to be supported. Um, I have a client that's getting ready to, to go in and she has been talked into having induction done. And I, I don't feel comfortable going into the hospital for five days myself. So what I've told her is that I will come, I will be with her virtually until she gets to just before active labor or an active labor and then I'll come. Because then instead of a five day possible and being in the hospital, I'm only there for one or two days. And I just, I feel like I have to have self-care for myself, that I have to take care of myself and be healthy for myself and other patients and other clients that are coming along. So I can't sit in a hospital for five days where I don't feel safe. And um, I think uh, most people are doing that. They're doing some form of in-person and virtual as much as possible. My, many of the prenatal visits are being done by virtual calls. Um, I think most people, when people go into labor and trying to labor with them at their home, either virtually or in person, I think I'll do in person when I can um, until it's we feel it's time for them to go to the hospital so they don't go too early. Um, and I, I believe what I'm hearing is that people are, are not going in at one centimeter so much anymore. They're really waiting until they get really in active labor before they show up to the hospital because for good or bad, people are afraid to go to the hospital. And um, the doula's place is to try to help assure them as much as we can that it's okay to go if that's where they've chosen to go or help them facilitate some other way, either having a home birth or um, finding a birth center or something that will make them feel safe while they give birth. Thank you. And, um, and I'm also wondering, um, Joy, from your, uh, also from your perspective and working on labor and delivery, sort of piggybacking on what Linda's talking about in terms of the birthing process, what are some things that you are um, seeing on labor and delivery um, that have been a response to COVID-19? And what are some, some things that you're doing to also help to support and center women um, with, with these, these changes in COVID-19 in the hospital? I will say it's exciting because, um, you know, I've, I've, you know, since residency, I used to everyone coming in, like, I think that like a lot of people come in because they're curious, but it's been interesting that people, women know their bodies. The people who come in are definitely like five centimeters or more and they're not going home. I haven't had a patient just come in and not get, and get sent home, like in any of my shifts since COVID started. Um, people really come in for indications where they need to be admitted or they come in for, like actual labor. So it's actually like interesting to me because, you know, you know, we're trained to like discern, but like women know their bodies and the people who are staying home know it ain't time yet. And the people who come in are like, it's time. So um, that's actually been really encouraging because, you know, everyone who comes in, I'm even more like high alert. Okay. So what's, what's your reason going to be to come in, um, which has been great. But I think at the same time too, I have had a patient who came in for just anxiety and a lot of the anxiety was because their appointment had been pushed to further their ultrasound appointment had been changed and they're like, wait, so I'm supposed to just like 
be out here, like, you know, just trying to figure things out. And honestly, I was like, that's a valid reason to come in. And she needed her medications increased for her history of anxiety. And that was a perfect reason to come in. Like, we're not saying do not come in. If it is, it's definitely benefits versus risk. Our whole thing is about safety. The reason why a lot of the restrictions are made is to make sure that both you are safe, both your family members are safe, the staff is safe. But if you feel unsafe, that's a reason to come in. Like, you know, you definitely know what your threshold is. And I honestly felt like, that was a, a good learning experience for me to see that someone was coming in because they needed to, because they couldn't wait four weeks to tell someone how stressed out they were and all the things. In addition to COVID, they have real life stuff still going on. And um, that was really like actually encouraging to me that a woman was really, you know, advocating for herself and said, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait because she wasn't an emergent case. So she did get seen very quickly, but she waited until she saw, you know, the physician. And it was like, I, I still feel like it was definitely valid. So, you know, just listen to it's the same things we always say, listen to your bodies. And I think the main thing, especially when we talk about black maternal health you know, is always censoring your own perspective and censoring and saying like, you can come into any hospital and say, I feel this way and I'm not prepared to leave, et cetera. Um, one thing I always tell patients is preeclampsia, one of the symptoms is impending doom. And that can't be really like quantified or qualified, you know, in a way, except for you to just to say that. So for me, it's definitely like, you know, how you feel is how you should present. And you, if you feel like it's severe enough, that's definitely a reason to come in. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and and it makes me just think about even the the reason why we're having this webinar and is really centering re reproductive justice and reproductive justice for, for Black women and for all women and for all birthing people. Um, and so my next question is for you, Monica, and mm -hmm. it, uh, if you could give us more around on your perspective and um, just things that we should be doing for to, to center reproductive justice principles in this time of COVID-19 and this time of crisis, when a lot of our, when sometimes principles can can fly out the door uh, when it, in crisis, how can we continue to center reproductive justice principles? Well, I appreciate the question. And, you know, I, I will say that the theme of this year's Black Maternal Health Awareness Week, you know, as part of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance is to center Black mamas so they can thrive, right? So, you know, it's timely that we, we are in a situation that's, that's a pandemic, but that we're really thinking about thriving. Um, I'll say a couple of things about reproductive justice. I said this on the BMMA webinar yesterday, and I think we need to keep saying it so that, that the public understands that childbirth remains the number one reason why people are hospitalized in the United States, right? And at some point, I hope COVID and pandemic, if we really want to be resilient and we really want to be innovative, we will think about what services actually need to be hospital based, right? Because what COVID has taught us is actually all of it doesn't need to be. And, you know, to Dr. Cooper's point, one of the things that I think is so important is, you know, the, the, the uh, need for ultrasound and non-stress testing. We know that there are tech companies that are doing things like home monitoring and uploading strips to the cloud so that people can be able to, you know, uh, make determinations about when to go home and when to stay home. But there's a more upstream justice argument that needs to be made that people have to have devices and data plans and internet bandwidth at home in order to be able to participate in that, right? Or to take advantage of those technological solutions. So what do we need? What we need is a corporate giving campaign, you know, for somebody to ask the Bezoses and the Amazons and all those folks, to be able to ensure that birthing people get things like blood pressure cuffs at home to be able to monitor themselves, to be able to get devices with data plans so that they can engage in telehealth, so that they can have nutritious meals delivered to them, not only in postpartum, but throughout their pregnancy, right? These are simple things that people are doing now that we could actually make permanent, right? From a justice perspective to say, how are we going to set up the group of people who are the number one reason why folks come to the hospital in the United States, and I will say this forever, there are approximately 4 million births in the United States every year. So the number one reason people are admitted to hospitals. And so what, what services need to be hospital-based and which ones do not? And, and, and going back to, to a point that Linda made, um, this whole idea of inductions and timing of birth, you know, my good friend and collaborator, Dr. Karen Scott always says, one of the things about hospitals and obstetricians and the birth team is we always try to manage time in the context of birth. And what doulas have taught me is doulas move with people through time. 
And so how do we reconcile those two things from a justice lens to, to know that there is a time sensitive reason why people need to be in hospitals around childbirth and labor, but how do we keep people at home as long as possible with their support team and to know when to go, right? How can we optimize that in, 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 within COVID? We've already seen innovations from doulas and from community members around that. I mean, Joy laid it out so beautifully. So how can we get that information to people so that we can you know, decrease miss risk or mitig lower risk for everybody? Everybody's at risk in the hospital right now. So pitting patients against staff, against personal protective equipment, to me that, that stops us from having a higher conversation, which is what needs to be in the hospital and then what can we move somewhere else? And what part can we televate, telehealth and innovate? And what part can we use existing community resources to be able to make sure that people get what they need? That's the conversation I want to have that comes from a place of justice where we all get out of this with low exposure, not just one particular set of, of either healthcare providers or, and or patients. But how do we all get through this and come out on the other side, you know, having learned things and knowing things, how to do them differently? Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and as you're making me think about um, how, how do we do things differently? What are, what are some lessons that we will, we should, and that we, we will learn from this time of COVID-19 to do things differently, to support black maternal health, to support re reproductive justice, to support equity for all birthing people, including young mothers. A lot of my work that I do is with young mothers and how do we also center their equity and their reproductive justice as well. Um, so my next question is for you, Dr. Cooper. And I'm wondering if you can share with us um, some of the, your other work that you've been doing um, to respond to COVID-19 um, through uh, culture care and also through your online centering program. We'd love to hear about some of those resiliency resources that you've already put in place um, during this time. So it's an interesting time for me. I don't think, you know, of course, you know, even as a physician, as a young physician, I call myself a millennial doctor. You don't think a pandemic is going to happen in your lifetime, but here we are. <laughs> so um, honestly, you know, a lot of what I was trying to do was really trying to centering, centering, you know, two things, Black women and Black doctors. And those are things that sometimes don't always overlap. And um, I'm a co-founder of Culture Care. Um, and what we do is actually, um, it's creating telehealth visits for Black women who want to see a Black doctor. Um, especially in California, when I moved out here, there aren't a lot of Black doctors. And even if they are, they might not be not might not be in your insurance coverage or they might not be in your actual locality where it's actually convenient. When I worked at a previous um, hospital, I had women coming from Sacramento to see me in Oakland just so they could have a Black doctor. And so I was like, there has to be a way to like make this easier, um, especially since we're not doing pap smears as, normal, as you know often as we used to do. So. Honestly, it's just really trying to create community online and whether that be with your physician or either other women. So we have different support groups. We have a fertility support group that is upcoming for women who are trying to figure out their options of fertility and having a support group of women who can talk to those things about pregnancy um, centering groups. So really just having different women virtually that you can create community with. Again, this is just trying to get past that displacement. Um, so the, it's led by a black doctor. You can center your voice and you can feel heard. Um, we even have a... Um, which is already upcoming was just a doctor doula program. I know a lot of women feel like sometimes like doctors make decisions in labor that they don't really agree with and they just want a second opinion. And we have it so that you can just message us and say like, look, they're trying to tell me I need this done. And these are all things that I've modeled on Instagram with my friends. Um, I have honestly like gotten ultrasound reports and you know, lab results in Instagram and people asking, so is this kosher? Is this, is this okay? And really I'm just trying to expand that beyond just my network of friends to like our broader network, because these are the things that are going to save lives. I've definitely like been able to intervene for my friends and prevent them from having really poor um, outcomes in pregnancy, as well as prevent them from having to pay a lot of money um, to get certain procedures done so they could get pregnant. So really it's just trying to give you a trusted opinion um, from a sister doc. Thank you so much for that. And, and continuing on thinking about and talking about resiliency and the things that we are implementing for resiliency, the connection that we're making to remain resilient. Um, my next question is for you, Linda, and actually it's also an ask. Um, what are some things that you are noticing in the doula community that are needed? So things that you, that the doula community needs right now to remain resilient and strong and supported um, in, in your work.
muted, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak to community doulas. And these are, are people who work directly with low-income women that are brown and black. Um, these, I believe, are the most important frontline doulas that we have because they're not just people who go in and rub your back or make you feel good. They're out there trying to take care of all the other things that are impacting this person as they're pregnant. All those discrepancies and things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. Like, do they have a place to live? Do they have food? You know, are they safe? Um, it's not, it's an all encompassing job for community doers. And unfortunately, they aren't paid what they should be paid because who's going to pay them? The community can't pay them. So in my opinion, the best thing that can happen is for uh, funders to fund community doulas so they can do the work that they need to do to keep these women safe in their pregnancy and in their birth and their postpartum. Thank you. That that was reminding me of, of what Monica kind of bringing it full circle. What Monica um, said around funding and the, the funding support is so important and being able to leverage funds. So I'm going to bring it back to you again, Monica, to see if and um, see if you can also add to um, what can we do during this time to really maximize the support that's being provided during COVID-19 for long-term resiliency and long-term resiliency plans for um, for Black maternal health. Yeah, I mean, for people who weren't on the Black Mamas Matter Alliance uh, webinar earlier today around policy, um, I'm sure this has gotten lost for the public, but I will remind everybody that on uh, March 12th, Monday, Mar or Tuesday, March 12th, uh, Representative Lauren Underwood, um, uh, really uh, from Chicago, uh, along with Alma Adams and the Black Maternal Caucus, which is within the House um, in Congress, introduced the Momnibus. And the Momnibus is a nine uh, bill umbrella, you know, package of, of, of legislation. I'll put a link in the chat box uh, that really uh, speaks to what Linda was talking about. So adding uh, new money uh, for addressing social determinants of health, a paying community doulas for maternal morbidity and mortality review committees, looking at alternative payment models for maternity related care investing in uh, 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 birth centers and other ambulatory community-based supports. All of that was in the omnibus. In addition to things that we've seen happen already that I think we as a community should demand stay permanent. Like the Center for Medicare and Medicaid has, has said that they will reimburse for telehealth and Zoom and, and what's happened, all, all sorts of visits that are, that are digital. That ne before in the past, CMS would never reimburse for, for televisits. And now all of a sudden in pandemic, we got CMS making <laughs> guarantees that they will reimburse people for telehealth visits. The fact that we've allowed for nurses and physicians to work across state lines. We've been fighting that forever. If, I'm, if I have a national license as a nurse in, that I originally got in New Jersey and I moved to California and I could apply for reciprocity, why can't I work across state lines? Well, in a pandemic, all of a sudden, nurses and physicians can work across state lines. That's been true in the VA and in the military, you know, for almost 30 years. Why can't that be true in civilian hospitals, right? So we've already seen things that we as a public should demand stay permanent, right? And so as we're thinking through the different bills and the different types of legislation, funding for social determinants of health, there were recommendations to do that within the omnibus. And really, even in our own state, California, we had a pending 14 county Medicaid reimbursement for doulas uh, law that was introduced a week before shelter in place went into effect, where we would allow for doulas to be compensated directly by Medicaid. And yes, we know that the reimbursement is very low and the reimbursement model is problematic. And we're trying to think about ways to make that more aligned with the barter and trade model that doulas work on. But for people who would want to have that as an option, doing a pilot for three years, that was introduced in our own legislature a week before shelter in place went into to effect. So as we're thinking through, the other big thing we need to be arguing for wherever you are as listeners, we need data disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. Fight with your public health people, your pu local public health department, your elected representatives, tweet at them, write them, call them. We need to know 
the cases of people who have been positive COVID in addition to the people who have been dying. Because otherwise we can't target essential resources and really be able to understand how not to make disparities that were already known before a pandemic worse and how to optimize opportunities for resilience and rebirth. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Monica. And um, that is such a great segue to our next section of our, our talk to our discussion today is really talking about those um, resiliency resources that we have at our fingertips now. Um, we know that um, Black women, Black people throughout the generations have um, have been, have encountered uh, struggles, adversities, and have um, been resilient and have thrived through it, um, uh, mainly by creating sort of community resources and and be able to help to care for each other. So we want to we want to uh, have a conversation amongst amongst us around the resources that are um, available both locally and nationally to support Black women, Black birthing people. Um, what are some things that you all have um, are talking to your patients about um, or things that you are um, sharing with other community members around resources for, for women? I can go. Um, I was really excited today. I had a postpartum televisit um, at my regular job uh, with a patient who was actually asking me who has a history of diabetes, obese, and was asking me like, oh, can I get back to exercise? And I was like, oh, well, I mean, you're kind of at that point where you can. And she said, well, yeah, I want to do all these like Instagram and YouTube, like exercise COVID things. And I was like really encouraged by the fact that, you know, social media has really transformed how we're experiencing right now. And luckily social media is free. You have to tolerate the ads um, and be tempted to spend. But Honestly, like it's great that there's so many free resources right now just on social media. So a lot of people who are doing free exercise classes, free um, webinars like this, this is advertising on, on social media. And I would honestly just say, you know, sometimes it's just in your fingers. Like it's really just like picking up a phone or going online and just seeing what's out there. Cause there are a lot of things that I think are more free now than they ever would have been in previous times. So I really am encouraging people to go online as much as possible. I know for us, um, we have a COVID uh, cohort of uh, pregnant women that we're going to follow. So you can feel free to, um, I gave the website on the chat and you can go to our website and join our, if you're in the state of California, you can definitely join and be in our group. And if you join as a patient, there's a, it's called closed beta and the code is no Corona. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in too. Um, there, there are a lot of like, like um, Joy is saying, there's a lot of things that people are getting very creative around and people can't go to childbirth classes, you know, so there's lots of childbirth classes that are being put online, uh, mommy movement classes that are being put online. Um, M2M is, is talking about feeding people, which is really, really important to nourish them during postpartum and also pregnancy, but um, we're dealing mostly with postpartum and talking about having um, a food box that they can be delivered to their home when they get home from the hospital. So, you know, we all know what's going on with the grocery stores. And if you're a new mom and you're single and you just had a C-section, you can't go shopping. So let's provide people with food. So I think the social media has kind of stepped up in this time where people really don't have any other way to get information. And that's what their go-to is. And I believe that there's a lot of things online that they can look for and find that are free of, free of charge, like Joyce said, that wouldn't be free at any other point in time. But people are knowing that people need to have this information because they can't get anywhere else, you know. Um, finding out how to, how, just things like, if you go to the hospital by yourself, you can't take your doula or your partner, or you're just going with your partner. What are some comfort measures? What are some ways you can move? What are your rights when you go into the hospital? Um, because they still need to know this information. So um, I, on BWBJ, we have on our website, we have a COVID section and some of that thing, some of those things are addressed there. But you, we want to get the information to them regardless of whether we can do it in person or not. So if we can do this virtually, then that's what we're doing. I want to echo everything that everyone has said. And I also want to put a plug out, you know, full disclosure, uh, you did uh, let everyone know that both Linda and I 
are on the Mothers to Mothers uh, postpartum, uh, you know, board. And, you know, what they've taught me is, is some corrections that I think are super helpful. You know, they've really developed a community-based model to be able to work with restaurants in an equitable and justice-informed way to be able to get nutritious meals out for delivery, you know, not gouging individuals like, you know, Grubhub or Caviar or some of the other meal delivery service you know, uh, folks. And so really trying to, you know, put forward that their community engaged ways to do that without gouging the restaurants and without actually gouging the people who need money. That's been a real lesson for me and thinking through what are other types of community engaged models that we can have. Groundswell Foundation, give a shout out to Nah Hemmen and her team. If you don't know them, they're, they're located here in Oakland. They removed all barriers. They're a reproductive justice funding organization and they removed any and all barriers to their current grantees and said, uh, they were one of the first foundations to step up and say, we're gonna automatically renew grants for our current grantees and not put them through any administrative barriers or hurdles. We're trying to do that now uh, with some collaborative partners like Robert Wood Johnson, who just said they would put $50 million into their current grantees. Guess who one of their current grantees are? Meals on Wheels, right? If we can get more foundations to be thinking about how to optimize what folks are already doing. I know this is, is coming. We are trying to work on this for dualism, black birth workers. We know you are all hurting in terms of not only being able to support community, but also loss of contract and revenue, but also that, that community connection that you put forward. We're working on a, a birth justice doula fund. Right, really trying to be able to make sure that we can get racially concordant, ethnically concordant, and linguistically concordant doulas to be able to continue to serve communities. Because guess what? When we get through this, we're still going to need y'all. Right. <laughs> so, how do we make investments now to ensure that everyone's not bankrupt when we come out of this? I mean, we just saw uh, another bailout, you know, package that's being talked about for airlines and other hospitality workers. What we need is to make sure that, that that conversation around the Black birth workforce is also reinforced and that that conversation does not get lost. There was a question in the chat box about making sure we don't exclude people because of, you know, uh, uh, certification rules and accreditation rules. We are looking at all of that in the California Doula Project. We are not trying to leave anybody behind. We are not trying to exclude. We want to grandfather everybody. Right? We're not trying to create barriers, but what we're trying to do is optimize and really unleash the creativity that really comes from community without exploding it. Yes, yeah, exactly. And uh, I just want to, so the, there was uh, in our conversation, the acronym BWBJ came up, and that's the Black Women's Birthing Justice. If um, folks don't know that, um, I also I want to echo again what all the panelists have said around resources and uh, and the fact that we as as we are in the middle of this crisis, continuing this crisis, we are continuing to resource ourselves and to reach out to our partners around strengthening um, our resources and um, the community health center that I'm affiliated with, Roots Community Health Center, that also runs Dream, the Dream Youth Clinics, um, also has a very active food program. So the nourishment is something that is so important important for, um, for pregnant women, for uh, women who've just given birth, for women of reproductive ability, and, uh, and, and something that really uh, folks can have scarcity around during this time. So Roots is also providing food in food boxes. So if people are local, if they're in the Bay Area and, um, and you need food, we don't want anyone going without food, please reach out to Roots Community Health Center and we will connect you with um, folks who can do a food box delivery for you. So I do, um, we, I want to really thank all of our panelists. We're not, we're not at the end just yet because we want to open up for some questions, but those are all the questions that we have. And we, what we wanted to, to make sure that we have some time and space to open it up for our, our, the, the question from the audience, because we know that there, are, there's also a lot of expertise on this webinar. And so we want to hear your voices and your questions. And we'd love, like to have more of an open discussion um, of uh, some questions that you might have. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat box and Liz will come back and we will read some questions and we'll, we'll, take, we'll take questions down and open up our discussion. Thank you all so much. This is an amazing conversation. It's so full of incredible knowledge. 
Um, and so let's hear some from our audience. Um, Sabrina Mahoney asks, what are some ways you imagine social work slash counseling services integrating into care for black birthing individuals during COVID beyond telenetworking? So I'll let Linda Jones tell you about uh, what uh, Black Women Birth and Justice is doing, but I do want to shout out a national organization that is part of uh, um, uh, Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and that's Shades of Blue. Shades of Blue is run by our uh, BMMA board member, Kay Matthews, and she's out of Texas. Um, and they are doing some incredible work outside of telehealth. They are offering, you know, just support webinars. They are offering you know, moments and opportunity just to engage with other birthing people. The other group of folks who are doing some really, really great work is uh, Dr. Saida Pepper and her colleagues um, in Southern California. They've been hosting some sharing circles as well, uh, using, you know, other types of social media to, uh, tools like uh, YouTube and Instagram. So, you know, I know that there are individual projects, and I'll put them in, in the chat box as well, um, so that you can go to those websites. But but Black Women Birthing Justice has been doing some really, really great work as well. And I'll pass it to Linda. Right. What we're, what we're doing is um, trying to have a forum space for doulas and midwives that are Black to have a centered place where they can come and ask me questions that they have or toss information around or get information from um, the people that are in Black Women Birthing Justice. Um, because our collective is made up of doulas and midwives and doctors and public health people um, and therapists. So if it's just a place that's like a clearinghouse where um, once a month we can have a group of women come together on Zoom and answer questions about anything that we have that, com that relates to what's going on with COVID or what's going on with their practices or how we can help better um, serve our clientele, um, all those things that are necessary for a doula to have community around. Because it's sometimes it can be a very lonely world out here as a doula, um, especially if you're located in an area where you may be the only doula within 10 miles and you don't have anybody that you can bounce things off of. So we have one woman who comes to the forum who lives in Alaska. Not a lot of Black doulas in Alaska. So she has a place where she can come and ask questions and um, talk about what her struggles are and how she, we can help her do that. Um, so if you go to the BWBJ, Black Women Birthing Justice uh, .org, uh, website, you'll see where there's a forum. And I think the next one we have is next Saturday morning. Um, we have another question. Um about uh, home births. Jaron Miller wants to know, do you think home births will be on the rise during or even after the pandemic? Anybody have an opinion on that? I'll, I'll take that. I this think so. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Monica. <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, the, so uh, there is, are some pending guidelines that are making the rounds um, be call, uh, called the AMUs which are auxiliary um, maternity units. And it's from the uh, American Association of Birth Centers and the Association for Home Birth uh, Midwifery. And, um, you know, they are guidelines to determine and to really set standards around existing uh, sites as well as new sites, you know, everything from actual birth centers to like hotels and parking lot um, where people can receive different pregnancy related care. And those guidelines are are making the rounds through the professional organizations so that, that folks can sign on to them and say, yes, we agree that these are the standards of things that we can, uh, we want to see happen uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, the guidelines were not written from a justice perspective. So the way that they're currently written, going back to the, the question around doulas and certification and accreditation, um, if you're not currently accredited um, or certified, by the two sponsoring bodies, then you wouldn't be eligible to be able to, you know, uh, be certified as an auxiliary maternity unit. So unfortunately, you know, it would it would not be helpful to many of our, our, our community folks who are already serving as community resources around home birth. Um, but I do see some movement in terms of, you know, I know uh, Centering Healthcare Institute, which is a group prenatal care, uh, the American Public Health Association, uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a lot of organizations are, are planning to support these guidelines. 
Um, and so I do see, uh, you know, uh, an increased interest in home birth and perhaps people exploring it as an option um, and, and really seeing some movement around uh, birth centers as well. So yes, I do see this as a potential pathway for us to be able to improve access to home birth and, and, and to uh, birth center birth. But again, we need a qualified workforce who can be able to support uh, black and brown communities. And right now we don't have that. But that also is not stopping people from wanting to have a home birth at this time of COVID. That was kind of like the first wave. People are like, oh, I'm not going to the hospital. <laughs> I got to have a home birth. And that's all well and good, except there's not enough midwives that do home birth to, uh, to help everyone who wants one. And everyone shouldn't have a home birth. You know, you have to have fit certain criteria to have a home birth. Um, and the fear that many of us have just in anecdotal talking is that people are going to not want to go to the hospital and they can't have a home birth or can't afford or can't find a midwife and will have what we call unattended birth where they just stay home and have their babies alone, which is fine for some people, but not necessarily for everyone. And I just want to caution people that if that's what you're thinking, um, you might want to rethink that. It's, it's possible, but it's, it's also a little bit unsafe. So I think you should try to find someone, you know, leave your partner at home and take a doula to the hospital and that will help you out or find a midwife that you can talk to or whether or not this is a good thing for you to do. Um, I, I just don't want to, in you know, a month here, but another way that black people are dying from being afraid to go to the hospital or to get, to get care that way. I just want to echo her safety concerns as well. I think I kind of feel justified in why I'm so black centered in my practice of medicine with COVID-19 because a pandemic hit the US and it's obvious who's affected more, it's us. And so same thing with you know maternal health, who's affected more, it's us. So for me, it's definitely about assessing your risk. And I think I think there are some really great midwives in this community who have assessed their own patient's risk and have been like, you know what, they might have to come into the hospital. I don't feel safe anymore. Um, and they're really like, there's a wide range of practice of black midwives out here. And this is probably the first place I've, I've met my first black midwife when I came to um, California, actually. So, and you know, everyone's just trying to practice safe. And I think it's important to have that extra um, someone to be in your ear to say yes or no or what to do, not just to say, I'm going to stay home. So I agree with Dula Linda. Okay, we have a question from Aida Davis. What are some indigenous, black, and native approaches to creating wellness for pregnant people now and beyond? Community? I will honestly say, um, Shout out to Urban Matriarch, AKA uh, Tanaf Tanafer, who I work with at Highland, who um, has definitely done some studying of how to do certain birth practices. And she did um, study of like Moroccan practices, um, different uh, traditions that they do for postpartum moms there. And A, the thing I love about it, she has on her Instagram, which is Urban Matriarch um, on her Instagram page, different pictures of what it looks like. Um, and the main thing is that you're not alone in the room, is that there are other people and other moms who are in the same, you know, in the same phase of postpartum um, with you. And I think there's a lot of stuff out there and people are definitely, the one thing that was good about us being able to travel so much in this time is that we're able to go pick up other cultures and not necessarily just read about them, but actually be there. And I know that Tanifer is one of the people who definitely has soaked up um, other cultures and tried to figure out how do we center uh, moms in new ways and new cultural ways. So I would definitely say community is one of them. And then number two is to definitely look who in the community has done the research abroad. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay, um, we have another question from Annalie Glick. Um, Kaiser East Bay is offering early induction at 39 weeks, presumably so folks can deliver early in the off chance they get sick. How can we support clients in advocating for themselves if they don't want early induction but are fearful of getting sick? What kind of questions do you recommend they ask their providers? So this is Monica. I put a couple of questions in the in the answered and the chat box. I'll say them here on, on camera. Um, what is entailed in an induction, right? So are they just talking medication? Are they just talking pit and meso? Are they talking about a Foley balloon? Are they talking about a mandatory epidural? Are, what, what, what do we mean? Do, are we talking about 
rupturing of membranes. It's like, so I would be very clear around what are they offering before they sign a consent for an induction? Um, because we know that there, there potentially are cascades of other types of interventions that sort of go along with that. Um, so I would be very upfront in terms of um, also what, like, what's the tolerance for introducing other interventions in the context of an induction. So for me, it's really more this whole idea of, you know, making sure that you're fully aware of what your rights are um, and to be able to, to ask the kind of questions so that you have a sense of, um, you so that you're not making multiple decisions as you go along. That you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm just going to have an induction. They're just going to give me some medication. But if that decision triggers other decisions that maybe you have or have not consented to, that I would, I would want to know what that means specifically. Um, and the other thing is, I think Linda's right. I mean, dualists know to ask some of those questions and to help support you get the answers that you need in order to be able to make a decision. Um, and so, you know, for me, I, I also think that, that one thing I hope that we can also uh, really push for is the continued testing for people of COVID because it's, it's not a one-way street. Right? It's not that the staff are, are somehow not exposed and we're bringing it in. It's both. right? So this idea that, it's, that it's, it's, it's being spun in a way that only the people coming into the hospital are the people who are potentially exposing folks is actually not quite accurate. And so I would like for us to have, to have a, a bigger conversation about how can we minimize everybody's potential exposure um, and be able to ensure like sort of good birth outcomes. Because I think too much people are worried about folks coming from the outside in, but we already know that people in hospitals are already potentially exposed. Also, I just wanted to say for the whole 39 week induction thing, I think, first of all, it's, there was a study that came out in the last couple of years called the ARRIVE study that actually noted that doing an induction at 39 weeks is actually possibly better than doing an induction at 41 weeks, which is when we typically offer induction to prevent that how you feel about that is how you feel about it. But I think if anything, it just means, I think it just shored up doctors and ability to say we can induce you earlier without it being you have to wait until 41 weeks. Because I think on the other aspect of things, we've been very paternalistic, like, no, if you had something coming up where your mom was only gonna be around for this amount of time or whatever, we were saying, no, we can't induce you because it's not safe. I think it's just more so we know that it is safe to induce someone at 39 weeks if we want to. I think before a lot of doctors were scared of elective inductions, which is technically would be an elective induction. There's no medical indication. Um, and that's different from people, there are women on, on the East Coast who are being induced at 31 and 32 weeks or rather having C-sections because they actually have COVID and actually delivering the baby will help their lung reserve actually function better because of the physiology of pregnancy. So there's different things. Um, this would still be an elective induction. So that means you can elect not to do it. it does, it's just an offering that they're doing just in case people, I think that also kind of plays into some of the anxiety and panic and hysteria that has been going on as, as well. But if that is someone's concern, but most likely if you're at 39 weeks and you're at risk for COVID and you don't have it, I don't think there's any like big push that now all of a sudden you need to be induced because you might get COVID. Um, but if anything, it's just an offering and you definitely have the right to say no, but it's also just sometimes nice for some people who might be displaced because of COVID or might only, you know, they're, they don't know how much, how they're going to pay what bill or whatever like that. And that might be a, an option for them, but it's definitely just an elective offering. But the, but the, the other thing you, you need to know is to ask how long is it going to take this induction? with the average number of times that it has to take. Because it's usually presented as, oh, you're gonna come in for an induction and you'll have your baby that evening. That doesn't necessarily happen. And I've been in inductions that last five, six days. And if you're 39 weeks and you're in the hospital for five or six weeks, five or six days, you could have just stayed home for another week. You know, why are you in the hospital where you could probably get COVID rather than staying home for that extra week? Um, I, I just think that people need to understand what an induction is because it's not always presented the way it actually is. And that people are always surprised when they get in there and, you know, it's day three and they haven't felt the contraction yet. You know, so it's important that you ask your doctor exactly what an induction looks like and what they're going to do based on where your body is at that particular point at 39 weeks. What, what procedures are they going to do? Are they going to use, you know, uh, uh, something to ripen your cervix, a, a misoprostol, are they going to use a balloon? Um, what are they going to do? How is it going to do? And how long do these things take before they, they have an effect? 
and everybody's body is different, of course, and some people react differently, but most people don't go in on, in the morning and have their baby at night in an induction. So it's important to get all the information around what an induction looks like before you decide that you've got something you want to do. Okay, we're going to have one last question because we're about to run out of time. And that is, what would you advise teens about sex understanding teen sexual encounters might be on the rise? Maybe I can um, start with this one. <laughs> yeah, so I, I um, and thank you for whoever asked this question. Uh, I think that maybe in general, there are sexual, more sexual encounters will be on the rise with folks either sheltering in place with people or um, also, again, some of the, the coping mechanisms that can come along with anxiety um, around this uncertain time. Specifically for young people, I always like to take it back to um, thinking about decision-making and even um, even before uh, before thinking about the actual encounter, but that young people are wanting to have sex with the person they're having sex with. So thinking about consent and not consent and just sort of this jargon type of word, but how do you feel about this person? Are you happy with having sex with this person? Is this something that you want or is this something that you're feeling like they may, maybe they want and so you're, you, you'll you decide to do it because it's something that they want. So really having um, conversations about what sexual decision making is um, not necessarily using such so the jargon terms, but really talking to young people about it and talking to young people about how they feel about the person that they are potentially going to have sex with. And also realizing that not all young people are having um, consensual sex. But even with all of those conversations and thinking and just, and um, uh, ideas in their heads about consent, they still may um, may be in coercive situations where they are either being being forced to, be physically forced to, or sort of emotionally co coerced to having sex with someone that they uh, may not want to have sex with. And so, if that happens. Um, uh, having resources for the, that young person, someone they can feel they can talk to, they can talk about this that this thing occurred. They um, they can have time for troubleshooting around that for their own support, but also for their safety. So really having this sort of multi kind of pronged uh, approach and letting young people know that there are resources. The Dream Youth Clinics. If uh, if folks are young folks are in the Bay Area, we have two sites in Oakland. Um, one is in downtown Oakland. It's our 18 and under clinic. Clinic and the other is in Jacqueline Square, our 18 to 24 clinic. We're still open. We are on Instagram. Look at our Dream Youth Clinic on Instagram. Um, young people can come and see us there if they um, need more resources or support um, to kind of get through these things. Because we know that we, we know that sexual encounters, both wanted and unwanted, will uh, will increase during this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Mays. Thank you all of you for uh, having this panel and um, giving us your time today. I know you're all really busy and it's been amazing to uh, hear everything you have to share about what's going on um, with Black Maternal Health. And I'm so happy that we were able to host this during Black Maternal Health Week. Um, I also wanna thank Mothers to Mothers Postpartum Justice Project for co-presenting this program with MOAD and uh, I'm gonna put some um, organizations up on the screen with um, donation links. So please support all the organizations you see on your screen and um, join us next week on Tuesday, April 21st at 4 p.m. for a conversation with Candace Elder, who is the founder and director of the East Oakland Collective. And you can visit moadsf.org to learn all about all of our online programming. Um, so let me get the... Uh, the video up or the presentation up that will um, show you all the organizations. So thank you again for everyone. And I'm gonna play this for a few minutes. Um, so you'll be able to, oops, sorry. You'll be able to see these organizations and you can support all of them. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity.